introduction, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Anne-Marie Adams, who, as I previously mentioned, is a co-host of today's event. Anne-Marie has joint appointments in the School of Architecture and the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill, and holds the Stevenson Chair in the History and Philosophy of Science. She's conducted research and written extensively on the subject of architecture and medicine. Currently, she is completing a book on Maud Abbott titled Maud Abbott, A Life in Ten Spaces, and she is eminently qualified to deliver our first talk, Curating Abbott, The Architecture of Medical Exhibits, 1931 to 1933. Anne Marie. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, for more years than I'd like to admit, I've been writing a book, Maud Abbott, A Life in Ten Spaces, that Rick just mentioned. The project engages the tools of architectural history, in particular, a feminist and material culture research method. This means rather than focusing on the challenges that Abbott faced, as in traditional women, women's biographies, my project explores the spaces she occupied. <clears throat> in today's paper, I present just one of those sections, number eight, called The Exhibit. The other spaces in the book include the predictable buildings, like her various abodes, old medical, Strathcona, and pathology buildings, and some perhaps less predictable spaces, like the Holmes Heart, an understudied portrait, a birthday party in New York, a mural, a postcard from William Osler, a scrapbook that's been kind of misplaced. And then finally, the conclusion is on Abbott's file on James McGill's slave, Sarah. These slides on the screen now show a rather famous 1972 uh, photo by David Miller of Abbott's McGill, McGill ghetto home on the left, and myself in 2019 showing great disappointment to find an empty site at her Philadelphia home address. Today, in presenting space eight, I juxtapose three traveling interrelated medical exhibits curated by Abbott in consecutive years in the early 1930s. What role did these exhibits play in Abbott's life story? How did this professional work enable Abbott's growing reputation in the face of her rare position as a highly accomplished women, me, woman medical researcher at this time? My argument is that architecture served as a platform for Abbott's medical work, projecting its extraordinary and highly mobile nature. Abbott's impressive exhibitions, and you see them here, for the New York Academy of Medicine in October 1931, the centenary of the British Medical Association meeting in London of July 1932, and most spectacularly, the Century of Progress World's Fair in Chicago of 1933, get uneven attention in existing biographies. Many authors note that the content of the first two exhibits became the core of her magnus op magnum opus, The Atlas of Congenital Cardiac Disease, published in 1936. Looking at the exhibits from a material culture perspective and making use of her diaries, for example, to get an, an idea of who was next door and who may have visited, illuminates Abbott's personal experience of curating exhibits. Beyond Abbott's special arrangement of specimens and texts, that is, the architecture where the exhibits were shown framed her work in particular ways, providing a platform for visits, collaborations, connections, and viewing. Each of the three buildings was designed to link medical and scientific information with another powerful realm. In the case of New York, the profession, in London, scientific education, and in Chicago, what we in architecture called architainment, projecting medicine beyond itself. Okay, so let's start with a description of a captioned photo held today in the McGill University archives. The black and white photographic print matted on brown cardboard shows a fairly plain, perhaps rectangular room with tile floor, flat ceiling, maybe two windows with blinds down, Though we see only one, two glass semicircular light fixtures hang on chains from the ceiling, maybe 10 or 12 feet apart. The dramatic shadows of the light fixtures tell us that the light source is on the extreme right. Leaning against the far wall facing the photographer are large boards with sheets of paper tacked on them in a sort of rectangular, at least parallel, placement. 
These sheets of paper contain text drawings and photographs. There are title pages tacked across the top that organize various sections of the presentation. In front of this exhibit wall is a table with a dark floor length tablecloth crowded with specimens in jars. Some of these are lifted on a base structure. Closer to the camera are two rows of glass tables with books exhibited. The aforementioned exhibit boards against the wall reflect in the glass tabletop. The handwritten caption in ink suggests that this is the McGill exhibit at the New York Academy of Medicine and gives the dates, 19th to the 30th of October, 1931. Also, a small white number in the lower right, which you see here, might indicate that it is drawn from a series, perhaps taken by a professional photographer. But of course, it's occurred to me that 31 might also refer to the year. The event in the photo is the fourth annual Nor New York Academy of Medicine graduate fortnight. According to the program, Abbott presented one and a half exhibits, both under embryology, the development of the human heart and its relation to congenital anomalies and cardiac anomalies by Maud E. Abbott and John Lewis Bremer, uh, professor of histology at Harvard Medical School. The program reveals that the exhibits took place on the first, second, third, and fifth floors of the academy. The program even lists the rooms, but not which one is where. Although we have the plans of the buildings as a building, as you can see, it is not evident which room is shown in the photograph. Perhaps it was in the basement. So what was Abbott's larger relationship to the New York Academy of Medicine? The main connection may have been through Dr. Thomas Archibald, or Archie Malik, sometimes known as Osler's bibliographer and son of Osler's friend, uh, Archie E. Malik employed as a librarian at the New York Academy of Medicine from 1925 to 49. In February 1932, so just after this exhibit, um, football player and coach, thoracic surgeon and New York Academy president John Augustus Hartwell writes to Abbott about their plans to develop a public health museum. Then on 18th of April 1934, writes to her about plans to develop a collection of instruments. The fortnight exhibit thus led to greater things for Abbott and perhaps put her on Hartwell's radar as she becomes in such a short time a trusted advisor of the New York Academy of Medicine on the matter of collections, museums, and exhibits. The plans here um, show the prominence of the library as, uh, as you can see uh, on the third floor in the upper left. The New York Academy of Medicine is an unforgettable building described by uh, architectural critic Matlock Price in Architectural Forum of 1928 as both Neo-Byzantine and Neo-Romanesque, designed by city architects York and Sawyer in 1925. The firm was a breakaway from Beaux-Arts masters McKim, Mead, and White and specialized in banks, hospitals, and dare I say clubby architecture like the New York Academy of Medicine, for example, the New York Historical Society. Its historicized, monumental, expensive design and its prime location on Fifth Avenue at East 103rd Street, facing Central Park and in the Museum Mile, signaled its cultural and economic significance in the city. Price notes its similarity to the firm's design for the Bowery Savings Bank on 42nd Street and note that like hospitals of the interwar period, buildings like the New York Academy of Medicine were historicist and modern at once. Price calls it thoroughly modern and humorously refers to its architectural style as blithe revival. Now two things the exhibit shows are a reliance on, Mo on Abbott's vast network of colleagues and her remarkable mobility. First, she was invited by Montrealer Louis Gross to this event, identified in the program as director of exhibits. We know this from her letter to New York physician Emmanuel Libman, 6 of May, 1931. She says, I have been very much interested to learn from Dr. Gross of the cardiovascular meeting at the Academy of Medicine in October, and I very much hope to come down for this. The fortnight program reveals, too, that Libman served as the chair of the Committee on Medical Education. The event is recorded in the Bulletin of the New York Academy of Medicine, 
but there is no description of exhibits, only an address of welcome, introductory remarks, and a lecture. Libman, in the introductory remarks, says, intentionally and somewhat shamefully calling out Abbott's participation. He says, although perhaps not, not quite correct to single out any individual here, we cannot refrain from drawing attention to the generous attitude of Dr. Mahdi Abbott of Montreal, who has come here with an extensive exhibit and who will stay for the entire period of the fortnight to teach the embryology of the cardiovascular system and to demonstrate cases of congenital uh, disease. In Libman's assessment then, Abbott is the star of the show. And by the way, Libman's 60th birthday party is one of the 10 spaces that I interrogate in the book. Abbott's exhibit at the British Medical Association in London, the best known of the three I will show today, took place at the Judd Laboratory of the Royal School of Mines, shown here, which was part of Imperial College in South Kensington. As you may know, Imperial College is dedicated to scientific and engineering education, growing out of Prince Albert's vision of a district dedicated to culture. Like the New York Academy of Medicine, it was a close neighbor to powerful museums. Here you see its spectacular neoclassical architecture designed in 1909 by the architect, uh, the same architect who designed the approach and the facade of Buckingham Palace. Sir Aston Webb. This is monumentalism at its height. Participating in the BMA was part of a larger, more leisurely trip for Abbott, who sailed on the Cunard Lines RMS Aquitania from the 26th of April from New York to Cherbourg. She had been invited in January on the cruise by Boston-based cardiologist Paul Dudley White and Ina White, and subsequently arranged for the exhibit at the BMA. And I must say, I admire how she arranged for the holiday and then figured out a way, a work gig to finance it. Surely a key aspect of modern womanhood. So we have extraordinary evidence of Abbott's travels with the Whites from both her daily journal and a special travel memories tra uh, diary. The moment when she reunites with the exhibit material in London after traveling through the Mediterranean with the Whites is particularly pertinent to this paper as it shows her personal involvement in every detail from the exhibit's unpacking to literally guarding it once it is up. For example, she says, stayed with my exhibit all morning on the 27th of July. From Abbott's correspondence, we know the specimens traveled in four boxes without a single breakage. The exhibit material was, was delivered to BMA House, shown here, the historic home of the association since 1925, designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, who also designed country houses and uh, public memorials and lots of public buildings and, of course, New Delhi. In London, the specimens were unpacked and then packed again by a technician from St. Thomas's Hospital Museum, quote, of course, under Abbott's supervision. We know from the travel memories diaries on, on July 28th, and this is, shows you her characteristic loopy handwriting, that an all-star all cast visited Abbott's BMA exhibit, including John Parkinson, Davis Evan Bedford, and Ludwig Aschoff. Parkinson is the name behind Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and he wrote an obituary for Abbott. Aschoff was chair of uh, pathology at Freiburg, um, and happily, the exhibit material has survived all these years thanks to the good care of the Osler Library. As with the uh, NYAM exhibit, we have a single photo documenting the display, and this splendid image was taken by the London Panoramic Company. The photo is mentioned several times in the diaries showing how important it was to her. It was snapped on July 19th. The cost was one guinea, um, and she ordered three copies, each 15 inches long, and then she forgot to pick them up. <laughs> she got her friend Mary Alexandra Bell Eastlake, the painter, um, to get them and have them sent. And it's just one of many instances where Abbott reveals her tendency to forget things. In the book chapter, um, I use a dozen or so diary entries to recreate the experience of visitors uh, to the exhibit. 
The bother and expense of the photograph were surely worthwhile as it appeared across two columns of the prestigious British Medical Journal uh, on December 31st, 1932. And this same article has very explicit links to her New York experience. So possibly the best ever spatial evidence of Abbott's consequence is the photograph of the BMA gala banquet held at the Royal Albert Hall on, the, on July 28th. Abbott wrote in a letter that she was at a table, quote, directly in line with the Prince of Wales. This is Prince Edward, who will become, of course, Edward VIII and abdicate in 1936, who's presumably at the center of the head table. So to sit on axis with the Prince of Wales in Britain's largest purpose-built concert hall, where Emmeline Parkhurst famously incited suffragettes to rebellion, among other transformative events, shows Abbott had truly made it. And thanks to Emily Klein, who's right here with us, for her detective work on the photo several summers ago, um, showing uh, 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 the Prince of Wales and where Abbott is sitting with uh, Burkett. Um, you can see that, how close she is. And this, this analysis resonates with my work on Emmanuel Libman's birthday party in New York as space number six in the book. Um, and I recently uh, given that as a lecture at the National Library of Medicine, so some of you may have seen that. Abbott's curating got better and better, and the third exhibit in Chicago is also our best case for architecture. Here are two postcards of the Century of Progress Fair in Chicago found among Abbott's papers, um, and they show the spectacular architecture uh, of the World's Fair. Abbott's involvement was around the McGill exhibit in the Hall of Science, Booth 17, Group L. And this amazing plan uh, from the Osler Library um, that is stapled with the contract has Booth 18 colored in blue, though, as you can see in the, on the, uh, the bottom of the plan. But I think what happened is eventually it was moved next door. So thanks to Abbott's archives, we know a lot about her experience of curating the exhibit and its physical details. For example, we know it was shipped by freight and, and Dean Charles Martin sent a telegram uh, with scale drawings of how to put it together. Relative to other exhibits, McGill's is super conservative. It shows here on the left middle photo. It looks like an oak paneled office, very clubby compared to the others such as a particularly modernist uh, one on cancer. But note that other med schools actually, not that many other med schools actually participated. The first thing to say about Chicago is that, sh that Abbott did not go. She had convocation and medical issues and was eventually hospitalized at exactly that time at the Ross Memorial Pavilion. Her uh, year by year diary tells the story um, and Interestingly, on May 26, Abbott says she feels depressed. Later in June and July, she has trouble with her knee, and we've got amazing details about her treatment at the hospital. I've worked a lot on the Ross uh, in another context. We have her weight. We have every book she read in the hospital. I hope to do some wonderful things with her reading lists in the um, book itself. So the sec McGill secretary, Edna Graham, did a lot of the assembly in Chicago. Look at this fabulous letter on Stevens Hotel Stationery, written to Charles Martin, the Dean of Medicine from 1923 to 36. Um, I, I actually thought Edna Graham was Abbott's secretary, but in a letter to, from the Dean, um, he calls her my secretary, so it's a bit unclear. Um, but the, this letter includes incredible architectural criticism about the uh, World's Fair um, and a lot of details on the carpenters who are putting um, the McGill exhibit together. So, he, and she says, the science building is the nicest of them all, which is, uh, you know, the kind, of, the kind of source I dream about finding. So a bit of architectural context, the Stevens Hotel opened in 1927 and then was the largest in the world, Beaux-Arts style architecture as you can see by Hullabard, Hullabard and, and Roche, had 3,000 rooms and had special lounges for women employees, so it was maybe a really good place for women traveling alone. Today it is a Hilton Hotel 
And when travel is safe again, I definitely want to go and stay there. So to wrap this up, what have we learned? In each of the three cases, the uh, exhibit architectures function differently. A nondescript room in York and Sawyer's eccentrically decorated New York Academy of Medicine, the Aston Webb Design Judd Lab at Imperial College, and Paul Kret's exquisite Art Deco masterpiece, the Hall of Science, share a history of displaying Abbott's tiny hearts and crooked drawings, carefully assembled by their highly mobile and distinctively female curator. This somewhat motley architectural collage then also reveals the range, import, and impact of, of Abbott's curatorial work, and it shows that her work was iterative. The lineup of architects is like a who's who of the early 30s. Honestly, I don't think I've ever given a paper with two knighted architects included, not to mention Lutchens, Hullabird and Roche, Albert Hall, Buckingham Palace, and the Prince of Wales. <laughs> the image shows the architects of the three architectures, American Philip Sawyer, who was dead by then, uh, the Brit Sir Aston Webb, and the French-born Paul Cret. To refresh, their buildings were the New York Academy, Neo-Byzantine and Neo-Romanesque, the Neo-Classical School of Mines in London, and the Art Deco Hall of Science. Three completely different architectural styles, but all especially designed to showcase medicine via the profession, via education, via what we might today call architainment. Two of the buildings were designed to last forever, or anyway to look like they might, while the third was purposefully temporary. These spaces brought important people together to view the exhibitions of Maud Abbott. Thank you.